it's, it's just oh. like the open-endedness it's like when you lie down in a field and a clear night and you look up and it's just vast that you know that sometimes makes my heart go a bit funny because it's like where where does the end where's where's the end of it i don't know it's, it's it's my stuff i know that but there's certain things that just give me a bit of a flip <laughs> but yeah i like the journey and i like the exploration and when you were talking about it then it makes perfect sense do you know what i mean that the purpose and the the meaning and you know where we fit into everything yeah because most people come to therapy i think a to understand themselves yeah which leads to meaning of life in some ways and maybe therapy is all about at one level that there's no real answers <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 89 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about different methods and approaches in therapy. Oh my gosh, good gosh, this podcast will go on forever, but we I know it's only going to last about half an hour. But number 90 is coming up soon then. It <clears> is, <throat> it is. Just a couple more to go, yeah. A long time ago, very long time ago, uh, I started to be a therapist in 1985. In 1986 or 1987, I was asked by... Um, Oh, because I think it was the ITV to be on a television program. No way. Yeah, and it was I can't remember what the program was, but it had three therapists and I think three counselors, and uh, we were talking about various things. But one of the people who was chosen to well to you know they the, the three therapists was me and another person called Wendy Dryden. And now we are about 40 years later, whatever, <clears throat> I'm where I am. But Wendy Dryden went on to write lots and lots of psychotherapy books. And his passion back then was CBT. So he's written a lot on CBT. But he's quite well known. He, he comes from London. Um, and, and he writes avidly. One of the books which is well known was on counselling and psychotherapy. Um, and individual work and in that book he talks about um the different therapy approaches and he quotes if this is correct i'll have to go back to his book uh, that um there's 563 different types of therapies and counseling in the united kingdom looking like the transaction analysis which i was trained in integrative psychotherapy which is what i was trained in I did object relations training as well. I did some hypnotic induction. It's only four methodologies, isn't it? There's actually a lot, lot, lot more methods. It's no program. wonder clients are confused a lot of the time, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because all they want to do is deal with uh, their problems. They don't want feel to... better. Yeah, and they don't. Uh, there's not many. Well, there's few. Very few clients that come in uh, and say, "Look, I want this type of method of therapy." Yeah, that doesn't really happen. No, very, very rarely. Um, they, they they want to be cured, or they want to be happier, or they want to be less depressed, or they want to be more relaxed. They don't care in a way that you know how they get there. Yeah, exactly. But it's interesting. It's an interesting topic because. You know, I've had clients that have come to me that have tried other other methods and it's not been right for them. Mm. Oh, that well, that that's interesting, isn't it? And it depends what what the I was what went through my head was depends on what the, the therapies was, and it really depends on the type of relationship they had with the psychotherapist. 
that's one of the things that I usually say because I think that is the most important thing rather than you know the the method that's used yeah it's I mean the relationship it, yeah absolutely. a big research that came out and I can't remember the book again it was in 1993 by North Cross I think it was um huge research uh quota we, uh, and and the clear evidence was that the relationship is far more important than the method yeah so if you i just did a workshop not long ago on how to work with the unconscious and the younger self and it was with it was two therapists and i was talking about the techniques and methods and the types of therapy that work with the unconscious and the younger self i'll just go through a few not 563 thank goodness uh, for that that's i will and then i well before i do that another way of looking at all these therapies is to split them up into five sections yeah one would be therapies that deal with behavioral change another section would be therapies that deal with cognition and thinking change another section would be therapies that deal with emotional change Another would be a section that deals with physical change. Another section would be those um, that work with spiritual changes. And also a sixth section might be those that deal with bodily change. And I'm sure there's other sections as well. Yeah. But in each of those sections, we could probably find at least 20 or 30 therapies. And I've another section which is as big. When I say spiritual, we could say transpersonal. And that covers many, many different types of therapy. And then there's all the um, therapies that deal with sexualities and gender and all sorts of things. So as I talk, I can start realizing at least 500 might, you know, might hit the button. But just in terms of therapies that deal with the younger self um, or would be evocative helping people access their unconscious because often you know uh, looking at how the past affects the present is really crucial you've got things like music therapy yeah drama therapy um, well transaction analysis is course in that um, art therapy um, there are three really one sand play uh, there's another one so we can look at all those creative ways hypnotic induction would be another one um, work a method I was going to say regression but that's more a method than a type of therapy gestalt psychotherapies to do so we could actually go through many many therapies in the humanistic section of the UKCP which I'm part of which would deal with how to work and you know how to work with the younger self yeah um, so there's lots of th therapies and, of course, there's lots of methods that go with those therapies. Let's just look at integrative psychotherapy, for example. So I was trained in integrative psychotherapy, uh, which follows the work of Richard Erskine, um, but who, who came from America and as an international organisation. Um, but his version of integrative psychotherapy it's very different from many other people's versions of integrative psychotherapy. And according to where you trained and what school you come from, they may have their own versions of what integrative psychotherapy might mean. So it it's quite a quite a minefield when we think of therapies, you know. It's yeah, it's mind blowing. And as you were taught, this isn't something that I've just thought about now. I often sit and muse and think about things like this. That there was a time where none of this even existed until somebody thought it up. Well, and that's an interesting put it way in a plan and put something together to bring yeah. it into the world, if that makes sense. Well, yes. So if we look at psychoanalysis. The birth of psychoanalysis, we usually talk about Freud, 
And that would go into the mid middle eight, 1880, 1870, 1860. I forget when Ford was born. But if we go beneath that, which is what you're, I think you're hinting at, there's a whole, there was the whole growth of what we call religious healing, which yeah. takes us to the 17th, 16th century. We, and I'm sure we could trace right, right way back. And I think it's the human condition to search for purpose, identity, who we are, how to understand ourselves, that level of curiosity. Yeah. That makes sense. Because we are always searching for something, whatever that something is. Yeah. Now you're into the whole of another type of therapy, which I really like. And I think if I hadn't been a transaction analyst, I would have been attracted to this type of therapy. And that's existential psychotherapy, which deals with existential issues like death, um, purpose of life, value of meaning, all the things I've just talked about, you know, which are to do with our very existence. Yeah. And Amy, you know, those though, you know, that school really appeals to me. Because I think that those existential issues um have been throughout whole of, you know, mankind, if you like. Yeah. See, but, there's a part of me that gets scared with things like that, Bob. <laughs> because it's like I like answers. I like to know where things end. And with existential things, it's like there's a lot of philosophizing and <laughs> I, I don't just theories and all those sort of things. And it's like, you don't, what's the right answer? And I'm not oh, sure yeah, that we get to that. Let's put another frame on it then, Jackie, which might look at this in a different way. I would say two of the most common problems the psychotherapists deal with, and I bet my bottom dollar, your practice, you're going to, you know, it's the same thing, is when people come in and, you know, when you sort of really go down the layers, it's about being out of control because they want to control. And then they I've overthink. had that very conversation yeah. with somebody today. <laughs> and they go into anxiety, overthinking, overwhelmed. But con being in control is very, very important. That's an existential issue. Yeah. Feeling vulnerable and out of control is another thing we have regularly talk about with our clients. That's an existential issue. Purpose and uh, meaning of life often comes up all the time. So yeah. you might look at things in different ways, but if you're an existential psychotherapist, the last thing you're going to do is theorising or philosophising. It will be dealing with things like death instinct dealing things with purpose and meaning in life, but not in a philosophical way that I think maybe you're addressing, but in a much more human way. I understand when you say that uh, I'd be really scared of that, but, you know, as a therapist, all these issues come up, maybe in different yeah, forms. Yeah, it's, it's just forms. like the open-endedness. It's like when you lie down in a field on a clear night and you look up, and it's just vast that, you know, that sometimes makes my heart go a bit funny because it's like, where, where does it end? Where's, where's the end of it? I don't know. It's, it's, it's my stuff. I know that, but there's certain things that just give me a bit of a flip. <laughs> but yeah, I like the journey and I like the exploration. And when you were talking about it, then it makes perfect sense. Do you know what I mean? The, the purpose and the, the meaning and, you know, where we fit into everything. Yeah, because most people come to therapy, I think, A, to understand themselves. Yeah. Which leads to meaning of life in some ways. And maybe therapy is all about, at one level, that there's no real answers. Yeah, and that letting go of the need for control is a big thing with an awful lot of my clients. And, and it's, it's scary when you say to them, you know, we're actually not in control of anything. We can control our reaction and, you know, two things, but outside events are 100% out of our control the majority of the time. Well, 
you know, I was watching another reality television program. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I've talked about reality television programs in another podcast. But anyway, uh, when these people, were, I don't know, six or seven, they were be- they were buried in in caskets in the ground. And it was part of a task. But anyway, <coughs> you know, one of them, which I was very impressed with, uh, who was afraid of all this lot, she started to regulate her breathing because that's the only thing she had control of. Yeah. And so you are correct what you're saying. It's not much we have control of, but we do have control of our reactions, our breathing, slowing ourselves down. And you, and if people have panic attacks and palpitations, you may teach them that. Yeah, yeah. It's quite liberating speaking as somebody who was a bit of a control freak to to come to the realization that we can't control everything. And when when I came to that realization, it kind of took a lot of pressure off me trying to control everything all the time. Well, we have the huge, well, just in the last, what, five or six, seven years, maybe, Jackie, I don't know if it's more than that. We've had the huge um, increase in the um, whole area of mindfulness, Mm. which is all about that. Yeah. Concentrating on our being instead of doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think mindfulness is a really great, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's sold as a modern day phenomena, but it actually isn't. No. Yeah, I love mindfulness. Yeah. So meditation, mindfulness, all these sorts of things, they're all about being and moving away from doing. Yeah. There's so many therapies around mindfulness and meditation. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, the more you, the more you you think it, you know. There's like people have laughing therapy where they just oh, go in a room right. and laugh, or you know, right. sound baths where you listen to music, you know, like a gong or whatever, and all sorts of stuff. Reiki and the the list just goes on and on and on with different. <laughs> it's what I suppose <laughs> it's it's what fits for you, you know. It's. For some people to go into a room and spend half an hour laughing isn't what they want, but for others, that will be right up their street. I think it depends on what... We should have a podcast on this. Is what we mean by therapeutic. Very good question. I'm going to write that one down. That's what what you're really talking about. Yeah. Uh, What do we mean by therapeutic and what do we mean by cure? Yes. Um, and then we'd, we, <laughs> that would determine the therapy that we choose. That is a good topic uh, in a podcast. Yes, definitely. Because yeah, we'll it, it's individual to each one of us, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I, think, I do really believe, though, that a majority of people come in therapy to understand themselves. Whichever therapy they turn to... Um, and a lot of the methods might change, but ostensibly people want to uh, understand themselves. And why they want to understand themselves is because they want to then have a more beneficial life or a higher quality of life, whatever that is for them. But unless they understand themselves, it's much more harder. You can yeah. give lots of behavioral tasks. So someone who comes in and um, has been smoking cigarettes for 30 years, you can give them behavioural tasks to help them stop smoking. But unless they deal with what's underneath it all, I believe those beha- I believe those changes they might make in according to behavioural tasks will fall away quite quickly. Yeah. Unless you get beneath the plaster and look at what is bubbling away there. So people need to understand themselves, I think. And I think there's a real existential thrust for people to do that. Yeah. Yeah, because once we understand... I'm going to cough. (laughs) Once we understand ourselves, 
and we become more aware, then we're open to the possibility of change. But if we don't understand our own behaviour or why we do what we do, then we can't possibly change it really. Not not lasting change. Oh, that's it, not lasting change. Yeah. I think by understanding ourselves, we have the elusive maybe possibility of choice. Yeah. <laughs> and once we can then have that option to choose different ways, et cetera, et cetera, we might lead which might lead to change. Yeah. Yeah. I I wrote a book called Your Right to Choose in 1986. You've done a lot of things, Bob. Yeah, it's, it, which uh, I produced about five or more. I don't know. It's private publishing of about a thousand copies. I've got a couple. I've have got a couple left somewhere along the line because I kept them, thinking, oh, they'll just all go, and they did all go. But I kept a couple, uh, and I I've always believed that therapy is helping people get to a place of discovering they have the, their own right to choose. Yeah, that's Whichever quite direction. powerful. Yeah. Whichever direction they go. Yeah. Therapy should never be about the therapist telling uh, people what to do. I think therapy is about, by definition, helping the person discover their own opportunity to choose or their yeah. own opportunity for their own truth rather than the truth of the therapist. Yeah, and, and therapy is wonderful for that because I, I can't think of any other time or place other than in the therapy room where you get to explore this stuff without fear of judgment or interruption or, you know, presumption or any of that sort of stuff it's it's a totally unique space and so it should be yeah you know in the outside world we're always trying to fit into social norms or worried about you know people's opinion of us or what we should be doing or what we should be thinking and all those sorts of things and all these different therapies have at the heart i hope uh, helping the person or being a facilitator, the person at least understanding themselves and enhancing their lives and helping them understand that they've got options for change. And um, maybe we could talk about what cure is, but leading at least that direction. Yeah, because the, the, the thing is being a human being is that change isn't permanent. We're constantly evolving. You know, and sometimes people will say, you know, I went to therapy 10 years ago and I thought I'd sorted it all out, but, you know, there's some other stuff come up. And it's like, well, yeah, because things have changed in 10 years. You know, it, it's not do it once and then that's it, I'm sorted for the rest of my life because events happen, things happen. So we're constantly evolving and changing, you know, whether we like it or not. You're absolutely right. I mean, a model I do like is transaction analysis. Um, and I think that gives some good model in uh, the words of parent, adult, child to um, explain things really easily. Yeah. To get hold of. It's got, there's an accessible language there. Yeah. Uh, helps therapists and client in terms of a common language um, in the things we've been talking about. Definitely, I, 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 there's many. I think many disciplines like I like integrative psychotherapy, like Gestalt psychotherapy, a lot of like a lot of the humanistic therapies, uh, which help give the client the opportunity to get to their own truth. And our, our TA particularly helps the therapist and the client with an accessible common language to understand yeah. quite often complex psychological processes. Yeah, I think that's why I like it. You know me in a diagram, Bob. I love a diagram. <laughs> and, you know, what you were saying then, it's, it's about the client getting to their own personal truth. And, th you know, th that can be accessed through lots of different ways. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I started going to Pilates, and that's a therapeutic process for me. And yes. that's what I'm saying. Really, this podcast should, in some ways, be called... You know, what we mind mean by therapeutic? 
yeah definitely a walk in nature can be really therapeutic for me a lot of the time <laughs> absolutely absolutely it can i mean one of the really big movements in the last three or four five six years maybe more has been therapists walking therapy yeah the therapists yeah. walk with their clients yeah uh, equine therapy the use of horses and we've got we know already the use of animals yeah in our of therapeutic processes and yeah. walking particularly i think very grounding for example and a lot of therapists i know may um you know walk with their clients there's a marvelous article by one of my colleagues who uh, who uh, it was called walking the walking cure and she talked about how she used to walk with her clients and how um much how therapeutic that was for so many people yeah i i can completely understand why that would you know be a wonderful thing to do to to walk and talk yeah however freud <laughs> going back 50 years ago or whatever would have turned in his grave because he would argue that of course once you walk outside the consulting room you go away from the security of the consulting room uh the therapist comes along what he would call loads of multi-transferences and uh you know he would turn in his grave but i think all these types of uh walking therapy equine therapy all the therapies with many animals etc 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 are can be very powerful and very therapeutic uh, as long as the therapist is trained to be able to work with the client in that way yeah not to do it off their own bat yes yeah i think my biggest takeaway from this podcast bob is what you said you know what do we mean by therapeutic and what do we mean by cure yeah, what, of course, what do we mean you know yeah what is therapeutic and that's that's really got my old gray matter going <laughs> Yeah, and for most because of these... we don't need to be sat in a room, isolated from the outside world, and just you know two people or whatever it is in there for it to be therapeutic. Oh, not at all. I mean, what about the Win Hof method? Yes, not that I've tried it. Well, Carl <laughs> made me try the breathing, and I didn't like it at all. But yeah, no. well, I forget um, how cold the water has to be, but it's often called the freezing therapy. Um, so. Who knows? Who knows? I, I know many, many, many different types of therapy. And, and But I do believe, I do believe the therapist needs to be trained and not go off their own bat in all this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because even, you, you know, the most simplest of things for some people can, you know, evoke such strong, powerful feelings, you know, that the the therapist needs to be able to contain in a safe way you, you know so i kind of get what you were saying before about whoever had turned in the grave because they're out of the safe confinements of the room because it is a safe environment you know i, I as i'm saying that i'm just saying you know standing on a beach by the sea really makes me emotional it's very therapeutic <laughs> nobody needs to say anything or do anything just being there makes me emotional. Yeah, and I know quite a lot of uh, therapies where actually, well, let's take another one, silence, silent therapy. Oh, where... I'm not sure I'd like that. I don't like silence, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we got, I could go on and on, on. I mean, some of the most powerful therapies I have been, have been to do with the body and all the somatic stuff. Yeah. You know, that's amazingly... Uh, uh, can be amazing in terms of healing and cure yeah. and of course we're into the question again about what is cure and what's healing i mean uh, my daughter's a devout christian and she if she was talking here i'm sure she'd talk about the power of spiritual healing yeah and she i i'm a suspect she'll go back to jesus and the christian faith and religious healing and all those things we started talking about at the beginning of this podcast so wow. for many people there's many different approaches, and I think that um, 
what is therapeutic and what is cure is well i don't think we'll get mainly get to an answer but it would be an interesting podcast it'd be wonderful exploration of you know what that is yeah but i've really enjoyed this one bob there's there's lots and lots of different therapy or methods of therapy out there I love and as well as all of that you know the the individuals that undertake each one of those are going to put their own slant on it also yeah. so yeah. you can kind of tenfold it all easily but i i think i've said this four times but for the fifth time i'm going to say it's really important that the therapist is trained whatever whatever method whatever model behavioral cognitive physical spiritual emotionally they need to be trained yeah that i believe is important yeah me too and have somewhere to take it as in supervision yes yes some sense of accountability yeah yeah for the for their own well-being as much as anything else oh for theirs and and and, and for clients yeah 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 definitely safeguarding the client but i think you know for for us as therapists to be able to take that to somebody with knowledge as well i think is is important i'll tell you another therapy i mean like i know we're ending but uh ruby wax do you remember her yes yeah yeah she became a psychotherapist and she um was really passionate about compassionate therapy that sounds good and i i really like compassionate therapy i just yeah i think compassion to find compassion for ourselves how we do that is really important yeah you know, find different ways but uh i was thinking of pamela anderson another well-known yes. comedian who became a psychotherapist and um i forget what model she trained in but I think it's so important for the therapist to have proper professional training, whatever model method they use, behavioural, physical, cognitive, whatever it is, they do need to have some training. Yeah, definitely. And they can always go to the Institute, Bob. Oh, yeah, you always go. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a very good place to trade. I can vouch for that. So you... until until next time where i think what we're going to be talking about if we don't veer off topic again is what works in therapy is that what the title of the next oh my gosh well it's certainly le- it's, that's, that's certainly a wide topic isn't it yeah perhaps i'll start with what doesn't work yes to get to maybe that works. can be the title what does or doesn't work in therapy yeah i think that's a better title because the, the two go together yeah Whatever model a person um, picks or goes for, uh, what works and what doesn't work is vital importance, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of therapeutic change and cure. Yeah. And us not being fixed in the therapy room. As in, this is what's going to work, (laughs) whether you like it or not. Right. Until next time, Bob. See you then. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.